we are very lucky today to invite to the MSSR 2020 stage uh, Siegfried Hecker, um, who will be speaking with us today about his experience in, in his scientific work with nuclear weapons and nuclear nonproliferation, um, and really putting a cap on that chapter of this summer symposium for us. Um, Siegfried Hecker is a professor uh, research in the Department of Management Science and Engineering and a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. He was co-director of CISAC from 2007 to 2012. From 1986 to 1997, Dr. Hecker served as the fifth director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Hecker is an internationally recognized expert in plutonium science, global threat reduction, and nuclear security. Uh, in lieu of a, a full introduction that I would usually do, um, I instead today would like to share with you a video. And uh, that video will uh, serve as uh, setting the stage, kind of an introduction to today being a very important day. It's the anniversary. 75th anniversary of the uh, Trinity explosion, the Trinity de uh, detonation, which we'll learn about uh, in just uh, one moment here. ARSN AM 1490, Los Alamos. There goes the last DJ who plays when he wants to play. 65 years ago today, at 5:29:45 a.m. Mountain War Time, on July 16, 1945, the world's first atomic bomb exploded over Jornado del Muerto, which is the New Mexico desert down near White Sands, New Mexico. Always when I look back uh, on July 16th, uh, I just absolutely marvel at uh, what those men and women were able to accomplish in 27 months. It was just incredible, scientific engineering, uh, and societally. So that's the first thing that goes through my mind on the 16th. The second is the reminder of the enormous devastation of a nuclear weapon. And so the fact that, you know, when you split the nucleus, uh, you automatically gain a factor of millions over every other energy form that you have. High-speed cameras evolved right here because they wanted to see the very first instance of an atomic explosion. And I've got the Marley camera. I used to run it in the lab. This is the shutter. I ran that at 3,000 RPM. And here, here's the lenses, and these are mirrors. The mirrors put the images on 35 millimeter film that lies around the outside of this. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds.
Professor Hecker, everybody. Um, bit of a somber note to start on, I apologize, but a very important note, I believe, um, for us to, uh, to start today's conversation um, with, uh, with Professor Hecker. And with that, I, I do pass the microphone over to him to, to start the lecture. Very good, Charlotte. Thank you very much. And um, how nice it is to uh, see, at least I can see some number of you, and I'll scroll down to keep an eye uh, on, on all of you. So it's a great pleasure uh, to once again join uh, the Monterey Summer Seminar Series on Russia. I've done that every year for the last, uh, I think just about since Professor Vasilieva uh, started this. So it's always been uh, my great pleasure. And um, I look forward uh, to uh, your questions. Uh, I was asked uh, uh, this year to sort of look back and, and look at nuclear cooperation uh, between the uh, Russians and the American nuclear scientists. So what you just saw, uh, by the way, was not my selection. Uh, but since it was Trinity uh, Day today, uh, so in fact, just a few hours ago, uh, you know, not too far from where I'm sitting right now, I'm sitting in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, which is close to Los Alamos, uh, and not quite 200 miles uh, north uh, of where the Trinity explosion took place 75 years ago. Uh, and uh, as, as you heard in the video, uh, it said 65 years ago, because that video was made uh, 10 years ago, and it was offered by Bob Fry uh, to Professor Vasilieva uh, to perhaps show it uh, on uh, this day, the 75th anniversary. Uh, so while we're on anniversaries, let me also tell you, this is actually uh, the 55th anniversary of, of when I first came to Los Alamos. Uh, and that was in um, uh, June, late June of 1965, as I just graduated from Case Tech uh, now Case Western Reserve University, and I came out here uh, for a summer internship at Los Alamos, and that introduced me uh, to things nuclear, about which I knew very little before then. Uh, and then uh, I've, I've, I've been here at, at Los Alamos off and on uh, for all of that time. Of course, went back to graduate school, worked in a couple of places, and I've been at Stanford uh, since 2005. But I've always kept an office at Los Alamos, and I spend uh, uh, summers and some of the winters uh, here as well. Uh, so uh, my career then took me from uh, a Los Alamos uh, grad student uh, to a Los Alamos postdoc to a Los Alamos scientist uh, uh, coming back in 1973, being involved in all of Los Alamos's uh, uh, program from weapons to civilian programs. Uh, and then, uh, for some strange reason, I wound up uh, being director of Los Alamos in 1986. Uh, and it turns out, of course, as you well know, being students uh, of uh, Russia and Russian history, uh, that's when things changed quite dramatically uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. And so, in essence, I was here as Los Alamos director uh, during the final days uh, of the Soviet Union, and then during the startup uh, of once again of the Russian Federation and, and the other 14 uh, states of the former Soviet Union. Uh, and so I've, I've had lots and lots of interactions uh, uh, with, uh, the, with my Russian nuclear colleagues. Uh, and what I'd like to tell is, is this story. And it's the story we've captured in a book, uh, which is called uh, Doomed to Cooperate. Uh, and it's the story uh, of American and Russian nuclear scientists, nuclear weapon scientists for the most part, uh, telling the story of how we worked together uh, at the end of the Cold War uh, in order to help to mitigate the problems uh, that arose from the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to focus my, my talk on today. Uh, I've done much more uh, uh, with Russia and, of course, with Soviet Union beforehand and, and uh, with Russia after. Uh, and also, uh, particularly uh, since I've gone to Stanford, uh, I've worked with uh, essentially all of the other nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons states. And I've been uh, in essentially all of those nuclear weapons states. 
uh, including North Korea, actually. So in the Q and A's, you know, if you want to get off to North Korea, I'm just writing a book, it turns out right now, as we speak uh, on North Korea, including my seven trips uh, there. Okay, so let me get started. So the way that uh, I like to start uh, this uh, particular uh, presentation uh, is uh, to begin uh, with uh, the, uh, the seminal event uh, of August uh, of 1991, which uh, in a pretty quick order led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And of course, uh, that was the putsch uh, when uh, Gorbachev was put under house arrest uh, down in the Crimea. Uh, Yeltsin stood up uh, on the T-72 tank in Moscow. Uh, the military decided to turn around. Uh, Gorbachev was allowed to come back, uh, but this was the beginning uh, of the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, and it had huge repercussions uh, in the United States uh, at the time uh, because, uh, as uh, it was found out not too long afterwards, uh, is that Gorbachev was actually relieved of what we call the nuclear suitcase, uh, and that is the launch codes uh, for the Soviet nuclear weapons. Uh, and so uh, all of a sudden, what sort of went through uh, the heads uh, of American policymakers uh, were the concerns as to what's going to happen if the Soviet Union actually does uh, split up. Uh, and in fact, what it triggered, uh, and there's a lot of fascinating history from that, you know, August time frame uh, into the time frame that I show here, September uh, and October, uh, with involvement uh, on the U.S. side of congressional people, involvement on the Russian side of Russian Ac Academy of Sciences, the NGOs, you know, the non-governmental organizations uh, were particularly influential uh, during this time on the American side. And then it led to uh, what I thought was sort of one of the greatest uh, political moves uh, in terms of international security by an American president. And this was a unilateral move uh, by President George H.W. Bush. Uh, and uh, the way he an announced it, actually he announced it first to Gorbachev in a phone call on September 27. Uh, and in essence, what uh, President Bush did uh, was to sort of to tone down the nuclear threat from the U.S. side. Uh, unilaterally, he said he was going to take all weapons uh, off the U.S. surface, all nuclear weapons off the U.S. surface ships, uh, and made another, uh, another several uh, unilateral concessions. And then he turned to Gorbachev on the phone. And, and, and by the way, that, that phone call now has been declassified, and it's really a fascinating discussion. Uh, where he said, well, Mikhail, uh, you know, I, I hope uh, uh, you can also take actions. Uh, and, and Gorbachev, in typical Russian fashion, says, uh, well, George, in principle, you know, I'm for all of these things. <laughs> well, it turns out he turned his in principle uh, to saying, yes, he will do this. And, and he did that uh, on a Russian uh, TV address on October 5th of 1991. And, and those two actions what we call presidential nuclear initiatives, really helped to tone down uh, the threat that the Soviet Union Gorbachev must have felt uh, during those very, very difficult days. Uh, and then uh, what it led to uh, on the American side, and if you studied nuclear things at all related to Russia, United States, uh, you've heard of this program called Cooperative Threat Reduction or the non-Lugar uh, program. And indeed, through the uh, involvement of non-governmental organizations, uh, through uh, the leadership of these two senators, Senator Sam Nunn on the right and uh, Richard Lugar uh, on the left, uh, they crafted this legislation uh, to actually uh, to uh, allocate and appropriate $400 million uh, where the American government uh, would assist uh, uh, Russia uh, in dealing with what? In the book uh, that David Hoffman wrote called The Dead Hand, which is quite a superb book, uh, dealing with what he called uh, the inheritance from hell. Uh, in other words, the Soviet nuclear program. So what was, uh, in their view, the inheritance from hell? Uh, well, in sort of popular vernacular, uh, one says loose nukes, 
loose nuclear materials, loose nuclear people, and loose nuclear exports. From a U.S. point of view, uh, as the U.S. looked at the Russian, uh, you know, first Soviet, now Russian nuclear complex, it was all a matter of danger. Uh, there was nothing that was seen as a benefit from an American point of view. Uh, and so the American programs were targeted uh, of preventing bad things from happening or eliminating uh, as much as was possible uh, of the Russian uh, nuclear complex. So let's, let's look uh, a little more closely. Uh, it's important because that change was, was truly a sea change. Uh, and it was a sea change because before that time, uh, people like me, you know, director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, and of course, many other Americans, uh, we uh, thought the threat came uh, from the nuclear weapons being in the hands of the Soviet government. And then, of course, one can look back of Soviet, uh, you know, the, uh, the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis, etc. So it was the Soviet government and the nuclear weapons they had in their hands. Now, all of a sudden, with the Soviet Union uh, essentially dissolving, the threat now was the nuclear assets, be they the weapons, the materials, the people, getting out of the hands uh, of the government uh, and perhaps into the hands uh, of some other countries or possibly terrorists. So that's how the threat changed. And, and those are the things that I will tell you then my Russian colleagues and I together thought uh, that needs to be addressed. Just to put some numbers on this to, to, to give you an idea, uh, the loose nukes at that time, we were talking about tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. At the height of the Soviet Union, uh, they had on the order of 39,000 nuclear weapons, 39,000. You just saw the Trinity explosion and then, of course, the two explosions in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that followed about three weeks later, uh, you know, they killed uh, altogether over 100,000 people. Uh, and of course, it was two cities destroyed. One bomb, one city destroyed. And we were talking about 39,000 nuclear weapons here. Of course, the Americans were no slouch either. You know, we had somewhere around 25,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, and it's not that we fell behind, but we felt uh, we, for the most part, had more accurate weapons and didn't need more. But no matter how you look at it, tens of thousands of nuclear weapons in today's world just seems totally, totally crazy. But that's where we were. Nuclear materials, uh, you know, these, these are in, in my longer lectures, which I didn't have a chance to do uh, today. I explained the whole nuclear business, but they're uh, there are two paths to nuclear weapons. One is plutonium. You make plutonium in a reactor. If you extract the plutonium, uh, it only takes on the order of six kilograms. In, in other words, a grapefruit size ball of plutonium. That's what destroyed Nagasaki. Highly enriched uranium is the other path. That was used uh, in, um, in Hiroshima. It turns out you make a, a simpler bomb out of highly enriched uranium, but it takes more materials. Uh, and so today we think uh, generally one says on the order of a few tens of kilograms it would take of highly enriched uranium. And I want you to look at this number, the fissile materials, namely plutonium, highly enriched uranium, the Soviet Union had on the order of 1.4 million kilograms of this stuff. 1.4 million kilograms. Six kilograms destroyed Nagasaki. People. Now, of course, there was a concern about people. The country comes apart, the economy goes to pots. Uh, the whole social system that was there in the Soviet times uh, disintegrates. What's gonna happen to all the people? Uh, altogether, there were about a million people in the Russian nuclear complex, military and, uh, and civilian combined, and so, certainly several hundred thousands uh, in the nuclear weapons community. And the question is, uh, what will happen to those people, what will happen to the secrets that they know. And then exports, you know, with a country coming apart, uh, with the economy collapsing, uh, will they sell uh, essentially anything that's not nailed down? Uh, that's what was sort of the popular um, uh, discussion in the United States at the time. So all of these, when you put them together, uh, I think it's fair to say that 
uh, when the Soviet dis uh, Union dissolved, as we looked at this overall nuclear complex, uh, this had the making of a perfect storm. So uh, immediately, one of the first things that happened, you know, as, as you most likely know, uh, is when the Soviet Union then dissolved into uh, the 15 uh, you know, former states of the Soviet Union, that actually nuclear weapons were stationed in four of those states, Russia, uh, of course, uh, but then also Ukraine, Kazakhstan, uh, and Belarus. Uh, and actually at that time, Ukraine, with the weapons they wound up with because uh, of the dissolution and getting their independence, uh, they were the third largest nuclear weapon state in the world. They had more nuclear weapons uh, than uh, any of the other states. And so the issue was, you know, what, what do you do? What do you do with those weapons? I mean, the, 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 the brain trust for those weapons was back, you, you know, in the Russian Federation. And so actually uh, one of the great cooperative uh, programs as part of the non Luga program uh, was to convince those three countries, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Belarus, uh, to give the nuclear weapons back uh, to Russia and have them dismantled uh, in Russia. And indeed that happened. Uh, the US paid for much of, of that activity. Uh, and Secretary of Defense, William Perry, who actually uh, wound up uh, being my colleague uh, at Stanford, because he was a professor there when, uh, when I joined, uh, he helped uh, to make that happen. So that was uh, a key uh, step. That was mostly a, a government-related program. I'm going to now switch over to what I'm going to cover in the rest uh, of the lecture, and that is the role of the scientists. Uh, and the scientists, uh, uh, we the scientists actually got to know each other first uh, in something called the joint verification experiment. They were actually two uh, different nuclear tests. The one on the left carried out at the Nevada test site, August 17, 88. The one on the right carried out in the semi palatin uh, test site on September 14, 1988. That's where the primary Soviet nuclear test site was uh, in the country now uh, of Kazakhstan. Uh, what the joint verification experiment was about uh, is what had been on the books for 14 uh, years since 1974 uh, was what was called the Threshold Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, and the two countries, uh, Soviet Union and the United States, distrusted each other so much that they never ratified that treaty. Sounds a little bit like the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban, where we sit now, where that was signed in 1996. Actually, in this case, uh, Russia ratified it. The US still has not ratified it. Well, we sat there for 14 years with an unratified treaty, uh, and the claims were that, well, you can't really, you, you can't ratify it because you can't verify the threshold uh, of a nuclear explosion uh, from a distance. And that threshold was 150 uh, kilotons, uh, as it uh, turns out. And, and so what we wound up doing is, is we got the scientists from their nuclear weapons lab, our nuclear weapons lab got together, uh, and uh, we did uh, the experiment. Being in uh, Nevada, uh, we put a Los Alamos nuclear device down hole, we set it off, uh, we had the Russian scientists on site in a, our super secret test site in 1988, uh, and they did an on-site measurement of the explosive yield. Uh, and then some NGO groups uh, did some off-site seismic measurements. Uh, and in essence, what we were able to prove is the off-site seismic measurements were good enough. And then we flipped the whole thing and did the same thing in Russia. They detonated one of their devices. Our scientists were there. Uh, there are lots of interesting stories associated with that because I was sitting in the control room when we set this uh, thing off, and I had the Russian scientist right across from me. But the reason I show it here is because it was the first time that we really met the Russian nuclear weapon scientists face to face. Even though, as I think you just heard from your lectures uh, from uh, Professor Sagdeya, for example, there was lots of interaction of scientists between uh, Soviet Union uh, and uh, uh, the United States uh, before this time, uh, but never had we collaborated with Russian nuclear weapons scientists, and, and we did uh, here. 
Uh, and in fact, uh, that then led to the verification negotiations uh, in Geneva. Uh, from Geneva, uh, the lead uh, technical expert uh, on the Russian side, uh, Viktor Mikhailov, uh, invited our scientists uh, to come uh, to the Russian Los Alamos uh, and to the Russian Livermore Laboratory, uh, as we call it, Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. Uh, the, Lawrence, the equivalent of Russian Lawrence Livermore Laboratory is in Snezhinsk. It's called VINITF for technical physics at the end. Uh, and the equivalent of Los Alamos, the first Russian laboratory, uh, was in Sarov, uh, and that's VINIF. And so our scientists were there. And, and it was it was simply amazing. You see the bonfire, you see them sitting under the tent. It was as if they had known each other uh, for years. Uh, and then um, I, I was able to convince the U.S. government, as uh, the Soviet Union uh, was literally falling apart in December uh, of 1991, uh, that we could have a exchange of laboratory directors. In other words, exchange visits. Uh, and that is allow the Russian laboratory directors to come to the United States uh, and to allow us, uh, myself uh, and my colleague John Knuckles from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory to go and visit the Russian nuclear labs. And, and here the Russians are uh, and the US on the left, uh, they are at a big laser at Livermore. Uh, on the right, we have the typical photo op with my, uh, myself sitting in the, uh, in the center uh, back in my mustache days. Uh, in the uh, United States uh, in February of 1992. Uh, and then just a couple of weeks later, uh, I was there and uh, I was able to go to Sarov, or Azima 16 as it was called. Sakharov called it the installation. Before that, they called it KB-11. There are many, many names, uh, but it's now in the city uh, of Sarov. And here's a person uh, we call the Russian Oppenheimer. Uh, and, and this was Yuli Borisovich Hariton. Uh, who headed their science program from the birth of the laboratory in 1946 uh, to 1992, shortly uh, after I arrived. Uh, and so here we are on the tarmac uh, in Sarov, uh, and then uh, we were toured through uh, the laboratory. Again, it's a long and it's a fantastic story uh, of, of that visit of, of a few days. We went on from Sarov, we flew uh, to Snezhinsk, uh, and actually we flew into Yekaterinburg uh, and then uh, took the bus down, uh, their bus of course, uh, down to, uh, to Snezhinsk. Uh, and again there we had these incredible discussion and, and now again remember this was just less than two months after the Soviet Union broke up uh, and we the scientists uh, are there saying hey look we, we have these new problems uh, especially now, you know, as all of these weapons are coming back, they're going to be dis, uh, dismantled, you know, disassembled. Uh, and the most dangerous uh, uh, phase of a nuclear weapon is it when it comes back and when you actually have to take it apart. Uh, and so we got together and this is the list of things that we recommended. I was told by the U.S. government before I left, they said, look, Hecker, don't sign anything when you go to Russia, because of course there was still enormous distrust uh, of Russia. The fact that we got to go uh, was, was quite unusual, but they said, do not sign anything. Well, it turns out, you know, for, since you all know Russia, well, you can't go to Russia and not sign something. I mean, you know, we have to sign something. What we signed was this, which was quite amazing. We we're going to work together on weapon safety and security in transport and dismantlement as these things come back from Europe, for example, or from the other states, uh, and then as the, the dismantled. We're going to work together to prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, and nuclear terrorism. Uh, what about emergency response? Uh, safety of the weapons remaining in the stockpile. And then what about cleanup, cleaning up the mess? You know, of the huge complexes on each side. And by the way, this wasn't just for Russia, this was both sides. Uh, so we signed this, I brought this back to, to Russia. I, I was told in, in the National Security Council in the White House, uh, they took this uh, document, crumpled it and threw it in the waste paper basket and said, there's no way we're gonna do these things. However, what they did allow uh, with much nagging was to say, all right, you guys can work together on fundamental science. 
You know, if you want to do that, you can do so. And so we said, okay, that's good enough. We'll start working together on fundamental science. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, so for example, here are just some of the photos uh, uh, of the visits to their laboratory. Uh, and, and the question, you know, as one looks back, is to say, now, why were we all interested in doing this? I mean, we were the weapons guys, right? There was sort of, you know, like two scorpions poised at each other. And so why would these nuclear weapons scientists all of a sudden uh, actually want to work together? And so here's my uh, take uh, on that. So as we look on the US side, well, there is no question. I mean, we were immensely concerned about the loose problem, the loose nukes, materials, people exports. Uh, and so we thought they're going through this traumatic change of life uh, and can we work with them to help them? Because if any of those things get away, it's gonna be bad for the entire world, not just for Russia. Uh, and quite frankly, from my standpoint, it was curiosity. You know, for heaven's sakes, we had this, you know, Cold War, the Soviet Union, you know, closed up. And even though we got some peaks uh, into the Soviet Union through some uh, cooperation in the scientific world, we didn't know what their nuclear weapons labs were like. We didn't know what their people were like. So it was curiosity. Uh, on the Russian side, as you probably heard in the lectures uh, earlier this morning, uh, you know, the, the, the Soviet scientific enterprise was absolutely first class. You know, a number of Nobel laureates and many of their great scientists got their education, particularly the physicists and the great European school uh, of physics. Uh, and uh, indeed, so did the Americans. But starting in 1945, uh, they were isolated. They wanted to end isolation, especially the nuclear weapons people. They wanted to pay their people uh, because just like the rest of Russia, uh, economic hardship was just amazing. And, and then they themselves were worried about you know, mitigating the nuclear danger. They said, we know how to take weapons apart, but we've never taken that many apart. And then hope. The fact that we came, the fact that we shook hands, the fact that we would work together during this enormously depressing time actually was a ray of hope for their scientists. And then again, this was not appreciated in the United States, but the Russian weapon scientists, they had this enormous sense of global responsibility. So that's what was driving uh, both sides. Oops. Oops, uh, okay. Uh, and then uh, I, I would say, I would add to that, and then as scientists like to do, it's to discover, to create. And as in engineers aren't so much into the discovery, engineers wanna build things. And so both the science and engineers, you discover, you create, you wanna build things together. So we all of a sudden sort of being let out of our cage, you know, after all those decades uh, of being locked up uh, on each side in, in some ways, uh, this was an opportunity to work together. Okay, so now that's why we did it. How did we do it? Uh, it's what we call uh, lab to lab, uh, scientist to scientist, shoulder to shoulder is what the Russians like to call it. Uh, and so since we did, we worked together and we did experiments together. We went to their, you know, secret cities, Sarov, Snezhensk, behind their security fence. They came to Los Alamos, to Lawrence Livermore, behind our security fence. Of course, we didn't show them any secrets. They didn't show us any secrets, but we needed the equipment, the facilities in those places. So we got a view from the inside, you know, what I'd call boots on the ground or uh, maybe boots sounds too military. I should change that to feet on the ground. Okay, so what happened once we got a chance to be in there and to work with them side by side, and we had our scientists who lived over there in Sarov for weeks at a time working together, we found that the Russian view of their nuclear enterprise was totally different. This was not an inheritance from hell. It was felt to be the means of revival so these Russian nuclear weapon scientists, they saw their country sort of going down. They said, we can help to revive our country. We have the intellectual capabilities. We have the people. 
So the nuclear weapons were seen, this is gonna guarantee Russia's sovereignty, you know, at a time where Soviet Union came apart. Nuclear materials, you know, you can use in uranium, you can use plutonium for civilian nuclear uh, production. The nuclear scientists, engineers, they were among the best trained in all of the Soviet Union. They were gonna be the engine of Russia's economic recovery. Uh, and then for nuclear exports, is one of the few things that they would actually have to sell that weren't their natural resources. Okay, so then here are the other things. We also, uh, we said, look, we cooperate to do good, not just to prevent bad things. You know, we're quick, we're flexible, we can work together, uh, which indeed uh, we did. So for example, this is behind the fence in Saro, uh, in, in Russia, and we're doing a magnetic flux compression experiment. Uh, and uh, standing around this, uh, uh, this particular device are as many Americans as there are Russians inside of, of Russia. Uh, this was actually a device uh, that Sakharov invented back in the early 1950s. It's to put explosives uh, around the place where you're gonna generate a magnetic field through an electric current, and then you're gonna compress uh, uh, that magnetic uh, field and you're gonna generate super high magnetic fields. And that's exactly what happens here. So uh, the person looking straight at you is Steve Younger. Uh, he was my lead scientist uh, in, in Sarov. And on the left was Sasha Pikov, and he gives him a typical uh, Russian bear hug because they just generated the highest magnetic field on earth through those experiments together. Uh, and then here we did side by side, as I mentioned, uh, instead of trust but verify, you know, which was Reagan's uh, uh, famous phrase, uh, we said, no, no, trust and benefit from that trust. You know, actually get something out of it. We had a continuity of effort. You know, governments come and go. We scientists sort of hang on forever. Uh, and then we had a window of opportunity and we took advantage. Okay, I realize that I'm having so much fun uh, giving you this lecture that I'm gonna run out of time pretty quickly. Uh, so I'll go through this uh, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and just the four big things. So what did we actually do? Well, we worked the loose nuke problem. So for example, one of the big problems in getting the, the, for the Russians to get their nuclear weapons back you know, to Moscow or to their disassembly facilities, where they were concerned about terrorism. So the Sandia National Laboratory people, the third uh, of the US uh, National uh, Weapons Laboratories, helped them with Kevlar blankets. Uh, and uh, that, that was a fantastic effort. Uh, the Livermore people actually had this, the, this incredible suggestion for the Russians. The Russians were saying, look, when we take these nuclear weapons apart, uh, the parts tend to get stuck to each other. Uh, you know, and we have a difficult time mechanically prying these things apart. Uh, and as we had a workshop on disassembly, one of the, one of the Russian uh, one of the Livermore scientists, one of the chemists says, oh God, you don't need to use mechanical, just use this. It, it's a common solvent. It's called DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. Uh, and it will just, you know, you put it in there, it'll just have your stuff come apart. Uh, Russian said, you've given us a gift. Uh, so there were hundreds of these type of projects. Uh, loose nuclear materials, quite frankly, that was my biggest concern. And that's one uh, that I worked personally the most. And actually, here I am signing uh, agreements for nuclear materials protection, control, and accounting. Here I am with Vladimir Belugin uh, at VNEF, oops, uh, and with Yevgeny Avroin from VNETF, and with uh, Nikolai uh, Nikolaevich Ponomaryov Stepnoy uh, from the Gretschatov Institute. We started this program for the next uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, U.S. spent about four billion dollars. We work closely. Uh, with the uh, Russian scientists uh, in order uh, to have them protect their nuclear materials, which they did. And their nuclear materials were all over, you know, for the Russian sites uh, and many other places. Uh, and of course, they protected those materials themselves, uh, but we shared our technologies, our methodologies. Uh, I won't have time to discuss this in, in great detail. This was probably the single most uh, important project I was involved in uh, uh, with the, the Russians and then also the Kazakhs. This is the Semipalatins test site uh, where the Soviet Union did, as you can see here, 456 nuclear tests 
uh, over the years, uh, underground, high altitude, uh, many others. Uh, and then um, as the Soviet Union dissolved, 25,000 soldiers went home uh, to Russia. Uh, and this place was left uh, not guarded very well. And in fact, here's an indication. Uh, I try to work with my Russian colleagues to say, could you guys in 98, could you guys come back with us to Semipolitinsk and, and tell us if you left anything behind that you're worried about that the Kazakhs now have to fix. Uh, and my Russian colleagues said, we're not going back ever to Semipolitinsk because it turns out the Kazakh government was trying to get reparations for the mess that the Soviet Union made uh, on the Semipolitinsk test site. So I finally went back uh, uh, with the help of some Kazakh friends and this was the main guard gate uh, going uh, to uh, the test site. And my Kazakh uh, friend had told me that, look, we're concerned because uh, we have uh, copper cable thieves on the test site. And, and I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, there are people out there, you know, they're excavating the place uh, and they're trying to take the copper uh, of which there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of that in order to sell it to the Chinese and to others. And so when I got there, I was expecting, you know, the Kazakhs, as you know, are nomads. I was expecting guys on camelback, you know, pulling on copper cable. Uh, but that's not what I found. What I found was this, these trenches of hundreds of kilometers dug uh, with modern machinery. And so the concern was, what's at the end of one of those copper cables? Because the Russians did, Soviets did a lot of experiments. Uh, out on the test site. So for 15 years, we worked very closely with Russians, with Kazakhs together, a uh, tri-party arrangement. Here's one place uh, where the Soviets had done a lot of plutonium experiments, not nuclear explosions, but plutonium experiments, and they left them in the ground because it was too hard, too difficult, and to some extent dangerous to pull out. So we worked with the Kazakhs uh, and with the Russians. The Russians helped to point out the places. Uh, we helped to pay uh, and to make sure there was a real proliferation concern. Uh, and the Kazakhs did the actual physical work. In this case, they put a sarcophagus over this place. And, and I show you the next photo just uh, to emphasize one of the most important things in any of our co cooperations. And, and it was the human dimension, the people to people. And on the right is my colleague, Phil Hemberger, uh, who took over the, uh, the Kazakh semi-Palatinsk work. On the left is Yuri Stiachkin. Uh, he's one of the Vinyev scientists who did those experiments out in Kazakhstan. And he felt it was his moral responsibility to go back out. Of course, with approval, for, you know, eventually uh, uh, he got approval so that he could go from the Russian government. And, and here they're having a, a couple of beers and some speck and some other things together. Uh, in a hotel room. And uh, this, and by the way, as I'll point out in a minute, uh, in the book of, of the Doom to Cooperate, uh, Viktor Stepanyuk, who was one of uh, the colleagues uh, uh, of Stiachkin, uh, wrote this and essentially says, look, we managed to, you know, to liquidate, to take care uh, of a problem of about 100 kilograms of weapons grade plutonium dispersed over the test site. Let me just put that in, in, in context. Uh, the North Koreans today, you know, as much of a problem as we have with them, have less than 50 kilograms of plutonium. Okay, uh, so the people part, uh, again, that was, that was really crucial. That's what Professor George, uh, was President George H.W. Bush was mostly concerned about, is what about the brain pain? Where are those people going to go? Uh, we work with them closely. Here's just this whole list of these experiments we did together on the Sakharov type experiments and also uh, magnetic, um, uh, conf uh, magnetic magnetized target fusion uh, experiments. Just fantastic. As I show you here, we did over 400 publications and presentations together, US and Russia. I personally worked uh, with the foremost Russian plutonium metallurgist because that was my background also, Lydia Timofeva. Uh, and we worked together, we published an article called The Tale of Two Diagrams because we had two very different views uh, of uh, uh, how you make plutonium behave. So looking back, uh, you know, you can ask the question, well, so was it worth it? 
uh, particularly, you know, today, as I'll show you on, on the US side, uh, people will say, hey, look, uh, you know, we worry about the Russians, they're building new nuclear weapons and so forth. Why in the world did we spend the total CTR budget was something like $12 billion. Uh, and this is what I tell them in return. Loose nukes, they are tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. The best we know, not one got away. Loose nuclear materials, there was a little leakage, but very, very little. It's just amazing. Loose nuclear people, uh, no significant nuclear uh, brain drain. You hear a few stories. It's not any worse than the United States, quite frankly. And nuclear exports, some problems in the beginning in the early 90s, but also not a major problem. And so whatever money we spent, whatever effort the Russians put in, this is the bottom line. Now, <clears throat> no disaster, why? You know what the Americans, with many Americans, well, well, we paid them, we put the money in, you know, we made this happen. Well, it turns out, uh, that's only part of the story, and it's not the main part of the story. The main part of the story are the Russian nuclear workers uh, and their nuclear mi military were professional, patriotic, dedicated, responsible, and then in sort of the Dost Dostoyevskian sense, willing to endure hardship. At times when I went over there, you know, not being paid for six months. Uh, by, by the way, I've been over there uh, since 1992 to last year in Russia altogether 57 times. So I've spent a lot of times uh, uh, in Russia. The US government took important cooperative measures. We need to look at that today and have the US government rethink about, we did these things, President Bush, Nam Lugar, President Clinton did the important things. Uh, and then the scientific communities on both sides stepped in just in time, uh, this lab to lab cooperation. So uh, it's been for 25 years. So on, on, the, uh, on the right uh, is Lev Dmitrovich uh, Ryabev. Uh, uh, he was former first deputy minister of atomic energy, once upon a time, the director uh, of Vinyev uh, in Sarov. And the uh, title of the book came from this comment that he made. He says, we arrived in the nuclear century all in one boat. A movement by one will affect everyone. He said, we were doomed to work together. I took that and made it into the title, we were doomed to cooperate. But, and we did. And then by 2014, everything had essentially come apart, uh, particularly uh, from February on uh, with the Crimea annexation uh, and things changed. This is a photo I took when I was there in April, 2014. Uh, I've stayed in touch uh, with my Russian colleagues uh, we finished a book uh, after this, uh, but uh, we've never gotten back anywhere to what we used to do because actually already starting in 2001, uh, the Russian government wanted to make sure they kept the Americans out of their nuclear facilities. After 2015, not only out of the nuclear facilities, uh, but away from the Russian nuclear experts. Uh, and, and by the way, their nuclear facilities They've been in our nuclear facilities as much as we have been in their nuclear facilities. And so now what we actually have is, is Moscow, and particularly under Putin, is rewriting the narrative of this remarkable uh, cooperation. Uh, here's the cover of the book. Uh, on the left uh, are the Russian, my colleagues, their reaction to the book, because it turns out they had to back out of co-editing the book even though half of the articles are written by the Russian nuclear scientists. When they finally saw this book, uh, you can see what their reaction was. They were shocked, but they were shocked because it is so good. It took them back to the glorious days of our cooperation. But now Putin's changing the narrative. He says in the 1990s, the Americans took advantage of our weakness. This whole cooperative threat reduction was an intelligence operations. It was to get access to the holiest of our holy nuclear sites. Uh, it turns out, quite frankly, that's just baloney. Uh, and he's even said, and not only Putin, but others have said, you know, they never got into our facilities. It's not true. I personally uh, toured Russian nuclear weapon lab director through our closed nuclear uh, plutonium facilities. 
Uh, we had them at our test site. We had them at, actually, we had them at our nuclear weapons assembly site. We always felt we had to do things uh, in parallel. But it's not only the Russians. Today, it's also the Americans. Uh, and, you know, what you see in America, and particularly uh, in, in Congress, uh, is you hear that, look, we spent $12 billion uh, on the CTR program. Uh, and what it did was it just helped the Russian nuclear establishment. It kept them alive. In return, they've now fielded these three new nuclear weapon systems that threaten uh, the United States. Uh, and just to boot, they violated every arms control agreement. So the narrative is being changed on both sides. Cooperation has gone down, uh, and that is a real pity. Uh, and here's what um, uh, Riabe finally said. It's our job is to convince the respective leadership. We have to work together. The alternative suspicion, return to an arms race, increased tension. Well, it turns out that's exactly what has happened from the time that he has said that in, in 2015. Uh, and so today, uh, I view that everything nuclear, whether you want to get the best out of the atom in terms of nuclear electricity, nuclear medicine, or whatever, or you want to avoid the worst, the worst uh, of the atom, you have to cooperate. We must cooperate together, and somehow our governments need to figure out uh, how we can get back to that. So the um, uh, best uh, that I can do today, because we're getting no help from either government, uh, is we essentially uh, look to all of you, and that is the next generation. Uh, and so thanks to Rector uh, Mikhail Strikhanov uh, from MIFI, uh, Stanford and MIFI have what we call this Young Professional Nuclear Forum, uh, where we exchange about a dozen Americans and a dozen Russians, we go to each other's uh, places to Stanford, to MIFI, uh, and we look uh, at issues uh, of nuclear cooperation, of nuclear threat. Uh, we do exercises together, uh, and we've actually written a number uh, of papers. I'm just finishing the editing of a number of papers that will go into the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist that looks at the legacy uh, of the three big nuclear uh, reactor accidents, uh, and that is Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, uh, and Fukushima. And, and these young folks have written those articles. Uh, in June of 2019, they also wrote a series of articles, eight articles in the bulletin on the future of nuclear power. So since we can't get our governments to cooperate, this is where we are. Uh, so Chalat, I'm gonna stop uh, right here. And I know you have the, um, uh, the tradition of a break. And so you, uh, it's in your hands and you tell them when they got to come back and then I'll be happy uh, to answer any questions you may have.